Coming in at number 10 we have Jack the Ripper. Who was he? The question has been asked for 130 years and we still aren't totally sure of the answer. Jack the Ripper famously killed at least 5 people or women in and around the Whitechapel area in London between 1888 and 1891, although he has been linked to 11 deaths and could have killed more. When he did kill, it was decidedly grisly to say the least. Of his victims were Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Jane Kelly. Famously the murder cases were never solved, but eyewitnesses around the time of the murders generally described him as being a dark haired shaggy fellow. Letters claimed to have been written by the killer himself were sent to the police, in which the author called himself Jack. So who was the ghoul of Whitechapel? As the crimes happened in the days prior to DNA identification, we can never say for sure, which means he's gone down in history as one of the most macabre mysteries. Coming into number 9 we have the Mothman. Can we call the Mothman a person? Well, by all accounts no, but he or it was certainly humanoid and very very much a mystery. The Mothman story spans years and hundreds of miles from West Virginia to Chicago, and possibly even Russia. In November 1966, two young couples from Point Pleasant in West Virginia claimed to have seen a large grey creature with glowing red eyes and a human body, but 10 foot wings. During the next few days more people reported seeing a winged man, indeed two firemen claimed to have seen a large bird with red eyes. A year later saw the Silver Bridge disaster, which saw the death of 46 people. The Mothman was spotted around the scene of the crime. A Mothman like creature was spotted in 1999 and foreshadowed the Russian apartment bombings. How did he get over there? Oh wait, he has wings. Oddly, in 2017, 55 people reported seeing a Mothman like creature in Chicago. So what's happening? Coming into number 8, we have the Man of the Hole. This man has lived in isolation in the Amazonian rainforest for 22 years. In the 1980s, the government bulldozed a highway through his part of the Amazon, and of course, Amazonian tribes have been under threat ever since we started raising it for agriculture. A lot of tribes have been destroyed by deforestation, and others by actual genocidal attacks. This is the environment that the man of the hole has lived in his whole life. Eventually, in 1995, the entirety of the rest of his tribe was killed, and he was the only survivor. The Brazilian government have kept tracks on the sole tribesman, but he has fired arrows at anyone who's come too close to him, and honestly, who can blame him? He gets his name as he digs holes filled with spikes to hunt. He's actually been captured on camera, so you can get a little look at him. Here he is. Coming into number 7 we have the man from Torred. This is the most amazing top 10 favourite. In 1954, a man in a suit who has been described as smart looking was detained at the Japanese border at Hanenda airport, arriving on a flight from Europe. The middle aged Caucasian man spoke French and said that he was on his third trip that year to Japan and he had a wallet filled with a mixture of currencies seeming to verify his business traveller status. Weirdly though, when he presented his passports, officials were baffled. Asking where he was from, the man said Torred as if it weren't no thing. He showed his passport again and the stamps actually seemed to support his travels, but again, they knew where Torred is. Here's a picture of his passport. Torred basically isn't a place. I say basically it, it isn't a place, not in this universe anyway. The man was freaked out when officers told him that they didn't believe him. Adding another layer to the mystery, he was carrying a checkbook to a non-existent bank and the company he was travelling to visit so that they'd never even heard of him, even though he was adamant that he had a meeting scheduled. When he was asked to point out Torred on a map, he pointed to where Andorra is today. Strange. The man from Torred was detained in a hotel overnight whilst Japanese authorities Authorities decided what to do with him, but by morning, he'd disappeared without a trace. Similarly odd at number 6, we have the Garlic Woman of Isdal. If you were paying attention at the beginning of the video, I highlighted number 6 as being one of the weirdest to me. In November of 1970, a man was walking with his two daughters and found the badly burned body of a woman in Isdalen Ice Valley in Bergen, Norway. The woman was found lying on her back in a remote area, but weirdly only her front was burned, her back strangely not so. Also odd, her jewellery had been placed around her. Her charred clothes were found nearby and had the labels cut out. Very strange. So too was the fact that an autopsy showed that she had 50 sleeping pills in her stomach. Stranger still, police investigating the death later found two suitcases in lockers at Bergen railway station. One contained prescription free glasses with fingerprints that matched the woman's. The case also contained a number of different currencies and several wigs. Police later found that the unidentified woman stayed at a number of different hotels using eight fake names 
and fake passports. Local businesses reported seeing a woman that matched her description, and one shoe store owner remembers her smelling strongly of garlic. In 2005, after seeing a police sketch circulated, a man who had been 26 at the time said that he had seen a woman fitting her description five days before her body was found. He was hiking in the hillside in Floyen. He remembers thinking it strange that she looked like she was dressed in city clothes rather than as he would expect someone to be dressed for a hike. He said that the woman was walking ahead of two men wearing coats who looked quote unquote southern. She appeared to be resigned and seemed about to say something to him, but then she decided not to. He did report it to the police because he was freaked out at the time, but he was told to forget about it. So what happened to her? Who was she and why was she killed? Was she a spy? We don't know. Her body is buried in an unmarked grave in Bergen, and her coffin is zinc as to preserve her remains. Perhaps one day we'll have an answer, but maybe not. Coming into number five, we have Alistair Crowley. Alistair is one of the most famous, or perhaps I should say infamous occultists and magicians in history. He labelled himself as a prophet, having founded the religion of Thelma, which is, you know, maybe pretty cocky. Right? He inherited his dad's fortune at the age of 21 in 1896, and that'll do it. Age 23, he was thrown out of a magic society for duelling. He went on a Himalayan expedition, which he survived, but actually, many of his companions died. He claimed that his body bore the marks of Buddha. Later, he began performing satanic rituals, and he practiced pretty intense bedroom antics, if you know what I mean. In World War I, it is believed that he was a spy for the British government. He took a lot of drugs and was hailed as the wickedest man in the world by the press at the time. Honestly, I have to say this kind of absent, swilling occultist, debauched and decadent image kind of makes me like him, like historically speaking. I bet actually in real life though if you knew him he was an absolute. I can't say that word on this channel, so why don't you imagine one and apply it to him. Coming into number four, we have Robert Johnson. Did Robert Johnson make a deal with the devil? The story goes that the popular blues musician met the devil at a crossroads in Mississippi, and when he saw him, he exchanged his soul for musical success. In utter fairness, he did become legendary, but like a lot of musicians said to be cursed, he died at age 27. The legend became enduring, with many people seriously believing it. People think that his song Crossroads is cursed and about the meeting with the devil. Bands who have covered it, including Leonard Skinner, the Allman Brothers, and Eric Clapton have actually suffered losses and tragedies, so maybe it is. Coming into number three, we have the woman on the grassy knoll. Also frequently referred to as the babushka lady, there is a woman out there who was seemingly present the day that President John F. Kennedy was shot in 1963 in Dallas. There are a lot of question marks surrounding the president's death even to this day. Officially, it was ruled as an assassination by Lee Harvey Oswald. That being said, evidence suggests that there was two shooters, with many other theories saying his killing could have been from a higher organization, like the Russians or perhaps even the United States government. On the day the president died, there was a woman in a headscarf stood on a grassy knoll as his motorcade went by, but she has never been identified. She was last seen moving away from the scene of the crime in the direction of Elm Street. Who was she? We don't know. Coming into number two, we have the Summerton Man. Often described as Australia's strangest cold case, the mystery of the Summerton Man is an unsolved case of a man who was found dead on a beach in Adelaide on the morning of December 1st, 1948. The man was slumped in the sand in a sitting up position. His head was resting on a seawall. He had a half smoked cigarette resting on his collar, and in his pockets was a portion of the final page of a book called Ruvayat of Omar Khayyam. I'm not sure if I said that right, I'm really sorry. The sentence he had in his pocket read Tashand in Persian, which translates as simply ended. Six weeks after the grisly discovery, a suitcase was found at Adelaide railway station, seemingly belonging to the man. It bore the name Keen, although nobody of that first or last name was reported missing. A few months after that, a copy of the book with the missing half page was found. It was turned into police by someone who claimed it was just thrown into his car near Summerton Beach, the place where the body was found. The man's cause of death remains unknown, as does his identity. He just was, you know, there and dead. All police know to this day is that he was likely around 40 and presumed to have arrived in Adelaide by train. Finally, coming into number one, a person that actually is talked about a lot over at IO, we have Baba Vanga. Ah, Baba, she's such a mystery. Her whole story is absolutely nuts. She was born as an unhealthy baby, and when she was a teen, she was lifted up in a tornado, an accident that then led her to lose her sight, but gained the power of healing and, seemingly, the ability to see the 
future. Before she died, she made a series of pretty accurate predictions, including 9 11, the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, the sinking of a Russian submarine. It seems that so far, her predictions have been around 80% accurate. So, what says she of the future? She says that the 45th president of the United States will be the last, that Muslims will storm Europe, and a freeze ray gunfight will happen in Rome in 2043. We'll find a new energy source on Venus. The ice caps will melt in 2033. The Earth's orbit will shift. Communism will return. There'll be an artificial sun. There'll be a major global drought. The Earth will get a ring like Saturn, which I'm here for. By the year 3000, not much will have changed, but we will all live underwater, and our great 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 granddaughters will be pretty fine. In the year 4000, we will get to know God, and we will achieve immortality. The end of the universe is coming right up in the year 5000. Wow, Baba, what a horrifying lady. If only she was here to clarify a few things, because freeze ray guns, I need more information. Alright, as promised, at number 10, we have Amelia Earhart. In July 1937, 39 year old aviation queen Amelia Earhart went missing. She was the first female to fly solo across the Atlantic, and she was also known for doing whatever the heck she liked. I like her. My favourite quote of hers is, Never interrupt someone doing something you said couldn't be done. The sass. Also, I love that she said, The most effective way to do it is to do it. Babe, I feel you. I feel like we would have been friends. Aside from being a major babe and an overall sasperation, she is at the centre of one of the most major and known mysteries of all time her disappearance. On July 2nd, 1937, just three weeks before her 40th birthday, Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan, disappeared in an attempt to circumnavigate the globe. It is thought something went amiss in the Pacific Ocean near Howland Island, but to this day, nobody knows as Amelia's body and aircraft have never been found. Many wild theories have been formed, some suggesting that she made it to Howland Island and lived as a castaway. Others say that she was captured by Japanese troops who held her hostage and the US government refused to pay her ransom. They wanted the upper hand in the Second World War that was impending, but they didn't get it. Some even say that she faked her own death in order to live a new life under a new identity in New Jersey, which of course does seem a bit far fetched. We may never know, although modern DNA analysis could have the answer. Bones have been found on an island in the area, and they've kind of been linked to the pilot, but at the moment they have not yet been DNA tested. If they are hers, then we'll know that she died as a castaway, but if not, well, the mystery continues. Coming in at number 9, we have Virillan. Who is Virillan? I'll let him or her or it tell you his, her, its self. Genders are hard when it comes to aliens. The Voice took over a British news broadcast on Southern Television at 10 past 5 on the 26th of November 1977. It was a cold Saturday in the late afternoon and it was already dark out. A lot of people were on the sofa watching TV when they heard Verulin's robotic voice interrupt newsreader Andrew Gardner. Verulin claimed to be a representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command. He said, For many years you have seen us as lights in the sky. We speak to you now in peace and wisdom as we have done to your brothers and sisters all over this, your planet Earth. Earth. We come to warn you of the destiny of your race and your world so that you may communicate to your fellow beings the course you must take in order to avoid the disaster which threatens your world and the beings in our world around you. Honestly, have a little listen. Wordy, these aliens, they're very wordy. Ferillon ends the speech by imploring planet Earth to change its ways before it's too late. Goodness. So who actually is Virillan? Well, saying a rep for the Ashtar Galactic doesn't kind of clear that up, does it? If that was alien contact, we still don't know anything about where this alien came from and how they managed to infiltrate our airwaves. If, more likely, Virillan was a sensationalist hacker, well, they were never caught. Southern television never found who was responsible. Virillan, human, or alien? It's still an utter mystery. V for Virillan, but skipping down the alphabet to W at number 8, we have the W Man. I love a tenuous link. The W Man is often dubbed the time travelling hipster for reasons quite apparent when you see his picture. The picture was taken at the opening of South Fork Bridge in British Columbia, Canada in 1941, but it got the world's attention in 2010 at a photo exhibit. So, in this picture, there is one chap who stands out. Unlike all of the other lads, he isn't wearing a hat. 
He is wearing sunglasses though, which nobody else is wearing. His hair looks pretty modern and he's stubbly, like absolutely nobody else in this picture. He also appears to be holding a modern DSLR camera. So where did he come from? The future? Like maybe, he kind of looks like it. Some people think his t-shirt has an M on it, which I guess also could be, I feel like I need more information, but unfortunately, I'm not getting any. Coming into number 7, we have Anonymous. Ain't no mystery quite like Anonymous, the so called hacktivist group prone to issuing stark warnings to large corporations, governments, and world leaders. The group are characterized by the wearing of Guy Fawkes masks and speak with a voice altering, kind of robotic voice. The group have gone after police officers by organizing cyber protests in the wake of fatal shootings of unarmed citizens. They've encouraged the safe care of homeless people. They've gone after the Saudi government to protest their regime, they've hacked Fox News, and they even have their own YouTube channel. So it is safe to say that they aren't well liked by the man, however they simply don't know how to track down the hacktivists. They describe themselves as modern day Robin Hoods, but I don't know, we just don't know who they are. Coming into number 6 we have Bell Gunness. Ah, Belle. Belle Gunness was one of America's most prolific female serial killers. Belle was physically very, very imposing and was of American and Norwegian descent. She killed her husband, children, suitors, boyfriends, and more for good measure. She was a killer. In fact, it is thought that Belle killed over 40 people between 1900 and 1908, which it's a lot. Just as her criminal activities were discovered, her house miraculously burned down. While a headless female body was found, it was not ever verified as belonging to Belle. Many people believe that she escaped. There were many sightings of the woman after she was declared dead. Police never managed to apprehend anyone though, so what happened to Belle? We just don't know. She was a master criminal and murderer, so if anyone could disappear, I imagine it would be her. Coming into number 5, we have the missing Russian princess. What happened to the Grand Duchess Anastasia? Anastasia was the youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Tsarina Alexandra. Basically, these were the last king and queen of Russia. The princess was inside the Ipatayev house when the Bolsheviks stormed and murdered her entire family. She was 18 and very beautiful at the time. Her death was considered by a lot of people to be an absolute tragedy. The only thing is, though, is that nobody was able to confirm that she did die. They never found her body, so they couldn't confirm her death. In fact, several women actually came forward and claimed to be the Grand Duchess Anastasia in later years. Stories were spun. One said that the family jewels were sewn into the princess's corset, which may have made them bulletproof. One woman who claimed to have been the escaped Anastasia was Anna Anderson. She claimed that she feigned her death to escape. Two other claimants said that they were Anna and her sister Maria, and they said that they escaped to the Oral Mountains and lived as nuns. Rumours of Anastasia's survival were going strong for nearly 100 years after her supposed death, until though a body was found that more than likely probably was hers, although there still isn't definitive proof. The story was even turned into a Broadway musical, which we all know I'm here for. Coming into number 4, we have Jerome. Who is Jerome and what happened to his legs? We may never know. It seems that in September 1863, a man in Nova Scotia, Canada was discovered by an 8 year old boy. The man was legless and suffering from exposure. The boy alerted his family who took the man into their care. He didn't speak any English, but curiously, he didn't seem to speak any words. The family named the man Jerome and they took him to a doctor. The doctor confirmed that his legs had been recently amputated. He still had the original dressings on them and the wounds hadn't healed. The family tried to teach him how to speak, but he seemed only to be able to growl. Theorists say that Jerome was a sailor who was punished for mutiny with amputation. Others say that he was a member of a First Nations community, but he didn't look or sound like one. Some say he may have been a wealthy man and heir to a fortune, but was disposed of. Jerome lived for 50 years after his discovery. He never learned to talk, and his identity was never revealed. Coming into number 3, we have Green Boots. This is so tragic and a stark reminder of the brutal nature of, well, nature. Green Boots was the name given to a frozen dead body of a failed Mount Everest climber. A lot of people, around 300, have died trying to summit on or on their way down from the top of the tallest mountain in the world. Some estimate that the climbers have a 1 in 10 chance of dying on their way down. The trouble is, it's too hard to recover a corpse from the top of Everest, so often they're just left there and they become landmarks. Green Boots became exactly that. He was lying on his right, his face towards the mountain 
Mountain and he laid there between 2001 and 2014. While known as Green Boots because of his bright footwear, nobody knows who he actually was. In 2014, his body went missing. Now, it may have been buried in an avalanche or retrieved. Either way, we still don't know who Green Boots was. Ooh, I love this at number two. We have The Man in the Iron Mask. I loved the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, The Man in the Iron Mask. It turns out, though, that it was actually based on a true story. There was indeed a mystery man in a mask. A super prisoner arrived at Bastille during the reign of King Louis XIV of France in 1698. The man was known only as prisoner 6438900 lengthy. It seems that the prisoner was suspected to be a high level political prisoner. He was forbidden from showing his face and was confined to an iron mask. In 1703, he passed away in the prison and his identity remains a mystery to this day. Now, The movie suggests that King Louis had an identical twin brother that he wanted to off, but more realistic suggestions say that it could have been a disgraced member of the royal family. Others say it was an Italian nobleman who had caused offence, possibly Matteo, who was abducted from the Italian court. The only thing is though that Matthew all died in 1694 so it couldn't have been him but who was it? Finally coming into number one, I actually kind of love this story. We have D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper. Wah! A man under the guise of D.B. Cooper successfully hijacked a plane in the airspace between Portland and Seattle in the USA on November the 24th, 1971. The man boarded and hijacked the plane, extorting $200,000 in ransom, and then jettisoned. He parachuted to safety. Or did he? Nobody knows where he landed or if he even survived the fall. There was an extensive manhunt from the FBI, but the man's real identity was never solved. Numerous theories were circulated. Also, the serial numbers on the cash that he stole were also released and searched for, but again, no trace was ever found. As of 2016, the investigation has been suspended and remains one of America's greatest unsolved mysteries. Coming in at number 10, we have Spring Heeled. Jack. Who, I say who, was Spring Heeled Jack? The name Spring Heeled Jack popped up in British news publications in 1837 amid a spate of weird attacks around Clapham Common in London. A one Mary Stevens was walking to Lavender Hill through the park when a figure leapt out at her. Rather oddly, the chap, or beast, kind of kissed her and ripped off her clothes with his claws, which is pretty awkward, and claws, I say it again. I really would not like to be set upon, and neither did Mary. She claimed that his kiss was cold and clammy. She screamed on attack, and rightly so, which spooked the man or creature. He kind of sprang away. The next day, a man fitting the attacker's description was seen jumping in front of a carriage, causing a crash. He then reportedly escaped by jumping over a nine foot wall whilst laughing manically. This odd behaviour earned him the nickname Spring Heeled Jack, who was also called the Terror of London in the media. Not a real person, I hear you cry. You are wrong. The light footed devil was actually officially recognised by the Lord Mayor of London on the 9th of January 1838. Following that, further sightings did crop up in newspapers, including a much publicised attack on two women in February 1838. One described the figure as vomiting blue and white flames, while his eyes resembled red balls of fire. My favourite is this 1867 illustration of the devil. He seems to have moved from London up to the northwest of England, and he was last spotted in Liverpool in 1904. So who or what was Spring Hill Jack? Coming in at number 9, we have the Green Children of St Martin's Lane. If you visit the village of Woolpit in Suffolk, England, really not too far from where my parents live, locals will tell you about a mystery that befell the historic place in the 12th century. Two children turned up out of seemingly nowhere. They spoke a different language and their skin was an off shade of greenish. The pair were taken in by kindly village folk who tried to care for them, only to find that they would only eat raw broad beans. Eventually the children's green skin began to fade into a normal colour and they were baptised by villagers. Sadly, the boy died, but the girl adjusted to her new life, learning English. When she was actually able to speak, she explained that her and her brother had come from a place called St Martin's Land, a world underground inhabited by green people. She said her and her brother were feeding their father's flock when they heard a loud sound 
ground and were somehow transported into an above ground field. Speaking of the whole life underground thing, this is how the girl was reported to have explained it. The sun does not rise upon our countrymen, our land is little cheered by its beams. We are contented with that twilight which among you precedes the sunrise or follows sunset. Moreover, a certain luminous country is seen not far distant from ours and divided by it by a very considerable river. Is this a hint at a parallel universe or do you think the children were faking it? If so, why were they green? Why did they stay green for so long? And you know, where did they come from? Ooh, this is such a mystery. Coming into number eight, we have Alyssa Lamb. This is actually quite a recent story, which makes it even scarier. Alyssa Lam is a true enigma. In 2013, the Canadian student went missing after a stay at the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. The hotel itself has seen many dramas over the years, but this one has video evidence and it's really bizarre. The video was posted of her from an elevator security camera by police and this was the last time she was seen alive. In the video, she's acting exceptionally strangely, very, very, very erratically. From the footage, it clearly looks like Alyssa is talking to someone who just wasn't there. She presses a number of buttons in the elevator, then the doors fail to close. She is seen peering out of the elevator and then trying to hide in the corner. She then exits the elevator and seems to be pleading with someone invisible outside of the door. Now the footage does end with her walking out of shot and the lift door opening and closing a number of times which seems to be a bizarre mechanical fault. Alyssa was travelling on her own and at first she was in a shared room but was moved because her behaviour appeared to be very odd. Now Alyssa was known to have bipolar and depression. She went missing at the end of January and her body was found on the 19th of February. Now, the grisly discovery was made by hotel maintenance workers who had come to investigate issues with the water pressure system. It seems that she was dead in the water tank. She was naked and her clothes and possessions were found floating next to her. It isn't possible for her to have climbed in on her own. It seems that her death shares some very, very disturbing similarities with the 2005 movie Dark water. So what happened to Alyssa Lamb and who was she talking to outside the elevator? We just don't know. Coming into number seven, we have the Count of Saint Germain. The Count of Saint Germain was a European adventurer who was dubbed the Wonder Man by Voltaire. The French national was a member of high society and he was hailed as a great philosopher. The only thing is, is that nobody actually knew his origins, where he came from or what his upbringing was like. In order to deflect questions about his upbringing, he'd say crazy things like he was 500 years old. He was wealthy and highly educated and at times claimed to be the son of a prince, although these were unfounded. It seems that at one point he may have been arrested in London on suspicion of espionage but was released. Lady Jemima York once wrote a letter referring to him. She said, he is an odd creature and the more I see him, the more curious I am to know something about about him. He died in what historians think were his late 80s, which is actually really, really old for the time that he was alive. Nobody was any of the wiser as to who he actually was, which is, again, super strange. Coming into number six, we have the Poe Toaster. Who are they? Edgar Allan Poe died in 1849, and just when we thought that the raven had quaffed its last, a hundred years after the American poet's death, a mysterious figure started appearing at the graveside of Poe's final resting place on the anniversary of his birthday. So that's January the 19th for all those who want to pop along to Baltimore and try and solve this mystery. The graveside figure is always clad in a black cloak and wielding a silver tipped cane ostentatious. I love it. The visitor brings with them three red roses and half a bottle of cognac. They raise a toast to the poet, drink it up, and then leave the whiskey and flowers graveside. While people go along and try and spot the mystery toaster, nobody has ever tried to uncloak or disturb the figure, which actually I'm really glad for. Some things I think should remain a mystery. Coming into number five, we have Madame Helena Petrovna Balatsky. What a mouthful! Did Madame Helena have real spiritual truth and paranormal powers, or was she a charlatan? Either way, I think I like her. Her narrative is debated today. She features in Lionel and Patricia Fanthorpe's book, The World's Most Mysterious People, and it's easy to see why. Helena was born in 1831 to a wealthy Russian family, and from childhood possessed unusual psychic powers. She ran away from her husband and escaped Russia aged 18 and went on a madcap adventure through the Americas, India and the Oriental East. Some critics claim that this never happened and that she made it all up, but whatever happened she did return 
return to Europe spiritually enlightened. She met a man, Mahatma Maurya, that she claimed she had seen in her psycho spiritual dream since she was small. The woman created her own religion called Theosophy and she changed her name to HPB and actually many people worshipped her as a guru while some were vehemently opposed to her. She spoke Russian, Georgian, English, French, Italian, Arabic and Sanskrit. Let's also remember that this was the 1800s, a horrible time for sassy bold women, but she was doing her thing. The mystery surrounding her probably comes from a society who simply could not believe that she was such a formidable force. Coming into number 4 we have Berenga Saunier. Berenga Saunier was born in 1852 and died in 1917 aged 64. His life and death sparked much intrigue at the time and beyond, ever since he moved to the French village of René le Chateau. Stories about the village and the priest consist of many many theories, some of which involve the mysterious Knights Templar, the Merovingians, the Cathars, the Holy Grail, Mary Magdalene and the remains of Jesus Christ. Oddly, the priest handled a lot of money. Documents from the 1890s suggest that he spent around 660,000 francs when he only had a salary of 90 francs a year. Some say that he found treasure buried under the land of Rennes le Chateau, others say that he found evidence that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and produced offspring that eventually became the Merovingian dynasty. Some think he was being bribed by a higher force. We know that the priest was fired, effectively in 1909, but he refused to leave the village of René le Chateau. For some reason, something or perhaps someone was keeping him there. His story has inspired many mystery and crime novels, including The Da Vinci Code. Coming into number 3, we have Caspar Hauser. Caspar Hauser seemed to appear from nowhere on the streets of Nuremberg in Germany. He carried a letter with him that was addressed to a local military. Man. The letter claimed that he was the son of a dead cavalryman and was to be taken in. He was taken to a police station and he wrote his name down as Casper. He claimed that actually he was raised in a dark dungeon and that the first human that he'd ever met was a mysterious man who visited him not long before his release. He always hid his face and Casper said it was he who taught him to read and write. Some people thought that perhaps Casper was an illegitimate member of the Baden royalty. The mystery continued. Often Casper would appear with wounded and he would say that a mystery cloaked figure had come to cut him. In 1830, three years before his death, he was involved in a pistol accident. Again, it was all very suspicious. In 1833, he claims he was lured into a courtyard and stabbed in the stomach by a stranger who claimed to have been watching him. Eventually, Casper did die of his wounds. His grave can be found in Ansbach, where his headstone reads in Latin, Here lies Caspar Hauser, enigma of his time, Mr. Mysterious as death. So what was going on? Was he making it all up? Was he actually an illegitimate member of the royal family? Again, we don't know. Coming into number two, we have Marie Laveau. Marie Laveau is one of the most famous mystical women in history and often referred to as the voodoo queen of New Orleans. I kind of like that name. She was born a free creole woman in Louisiana in 1801. Details of her life are pretty sketchy, but she managed to charm those who encountered her. Legend has it that Marie was beautiful, wise, and witchy. She practiced magic medicine and was able to heal people. It is also said that she was indeed a voodoo priestess and was able to read and control people's minds. She could summon spirits and raise the dead. It seems that she held a ceremony in her 70s that was attended by 12,000 people. They were oddly drawn to her. She died age 80 and people still visit her grave today, leaving offerings in exchange for requests and wishes. Finally coming into the number one spot we have Rasputin. Ra ra Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. Honestly I think that song is an absolute banger and it makes me dance all the time. And so too was the mysterious Rasputin a banger if you know what I mean. Rasputin was a renegade monk, a mystic healer, a sexual deviant and a political uprooter. He's also the man who would not die. Rasputin allegedly stopped the bleeding of the haemophiliac prince, son of Tsar Nicholas, and was rumoured to be a lover to the wife, the Tsarina, hence the song. Two and a half years before his death in December 1916, Rasputin survived a murder attempt by a beggar woman. He was stabbed in the gut and lost a lot of blood, but miraculously, he survived a wound that would usually kill. Then on that fateful day in December, he proved very, very hard to off indeed. It is said that he ate a meal heavily laced with poison 
but he lived. Then the men conspiring to kill him decided to shoot him with a barrage of bullets, but he still wouldn't die. They tossed his body into an ice cold river to drown, and I probably don't need to tell anyone how cold Russia is in December, right? Some further reports suggest that he was rescued from a river by passers by, and that he still drew shaky breath. Some say his penis was cut off and obtained, smuggled, and now reportedly rests in a jar in the Museum of Erotica in St. Petersburg. Also, it's said to be a foot long. I would show you a picture, but this video would be demonetized in a heartbeat. But you know, have fingertips, we'll Google. Not that I'm encouraging it. Although, I mean, maybe I am. So, Rasputin, what was the deal? You tell me. Coming in at number 10, we have John Doe 24. I only recently discovered that John Doe is America's way of saying, like, a generic man. In the UK, we have a saying that goes a bit like every Tom, Dick, or Harry, although they aren't popular names anymore. So, anyway, John Doe number 24. Let me tell you about him. This was the name given to a mysterious teenager who was found walking the streets of Jacksonville in Illinois in October 1945. The teen was deaf and was unable to speak or even use sign language. The only thing he seemed to actually be able to do was write his name. Lewis. Sadly, a judge sent him to a mental health institute where he was given the name John Doe 24 as he was the 24th person to enter the system, nameless. Despite institutions being brutal in their day, he made quite the impression. He was said to have been a cheerful man and loved dancing and laughing, don't we all? He died in 1993 after decades as a nameless man in the system. On his death, no one was any closer to discovering who he was. Coming in at number 9, we have Laurie Erica Ruff or Laurie Kennedy, or Becky Sue, or I mean, I guess who knows, right? Laurie! Can we make that rhyme with mystery? I don't know. I feel like we can give it a good go. Laurie. Mystery. Anyway, I digress. Laurie was kind of an oddball. She was married to a guy called Blake and they had a child, but she wouldn't let any of his family hold her. She was so strange, she'd do weird things like ask for an easy bake oven for Christmas even though she was 40, although I have to say that isn't the worst thing in the world, like let the woman bake. It's also reported that she loved a nap, which I'm also actually okay with. Throughout her marriage to Blake, she kept a lockbox which she instructed him never to open. Laurie had started becoming very, very strange when Blake asked for a divorce. Sadly, after a few very intense months, she was on a big downward spiral and ended up ending her own life. After her death, the lockbox was finally opened and it revealed some drama. It seems that Laurie Erica Ruff used to be Laurie Kennedy, who used to be Becky Sue Turner, but the only Becky Sue Turner her age had died age 2 in a fire in Fife, Washington. Laurie got a new social security number, and also in the box were mysterious scribblings saying very strange things like 402 months and North Hollywood police. What does it all mean? No one has ever yet cleared up the mystery of who she was, and they may never. Never. Coming in at number 8, we have the Count of Saint Germain. Was this man a saint? Was he a count? Was he immortal? It seems that he simply appeared in French court one day, and the rest, as they say, is history. The Prince of Denmark thought that he was one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, so <laughs> here's a picture of him so you can get a visual. The chap in question was born either in 1691 or 1712. The exact date is unclear. He did, however, die in 1784, but at times he would make claims like he was 500 years old, or he even claimed to be immortal sometimes. He said he was the Prince of Transylvania. Famous French writer Voltaire sarcastically dubbed him the Wonder Man, but honestly, I'm uncertain he deserved that level of sadness. He was pretty wonderful. Despite being unaccounted for, the Count of Saint Germain was well educated and wealthy, and that money had to come from somewhere. He wrote music, spouted philosophy, spoke several languages, he was a hit with the ladies. He eventually became an advisor to the king. He died without ever marrying, he had no children and no surviving heirs. Not that he had any fortune, if he ever had one. Nothing was discovered, just, you know, him. Dead. Coming in at number 7, one of my favourite historical figures, we have Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was a Croatian Serbian American creator known for his work with electricity. He also had a cracking moustache. As talented as he was, he was quite mysterious, and it seems that there probably was someone out there to get him. Perhaps it was all of the unpaid hotel bills he left behind him. He was 
an eccentric. Nikola developed a technology that was able to give people free energy, allegedly. He built the Wardenclyffe Tower or Tesla Tower in 1901 and he was planning on using it to transmit images across the Atlantic from New York to England using Earth to conduct signals. Now, The long and short of it was that he wanted to give people free electricity but his funding was mysteriously stopped and his plans were mysteriously destroyed. It was rumoured that he was up for a Nobel Prize in his time but that too was mysteriously hindered. Odd. Very odd. He indeed was an odd man anyway. He claimed to only ever sleep two hours a night and what he did with the rest of the time? Well, it is said that he used to feed pigeons at midnight in New York. One night he was off to feed the pigeons and he was run over on his way to do so. After his death his entire estate was quickly shipped to Belgrade on the insistence of his nephew. Fun fact about Nikola Tesla, he curled his toes 100 times each per foot per night claiming that it, I quote, stimulated his brain cells. I'm gonna try that. How does one curl a toe though? Ugh, toes. Coming in at number 6 we have the Watcher. This is an active mystery that continues today. Who is the Watcher of New Jersey? Many people presume it's a man but special studies of their handwriting have suggested it could be a woman. But I'm getting ahead of myself, let me tell you the story. Around 5 years ago in 2014 a couple in New Jersey purchased their dream home at 657 Boulevard for 1.4 million US dollars. Before they even had the chance to celebrate and crack the champagne, they started receiving weird letters signed from The Watcher. I'm sorry, who? Good question, but one that still doesn't have an answer. The first letter they received read, Dearest neighbour, allow me to welcome you to the neighbourhood. 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been in charge of watching and waiting for a second coming. The first letter stated that the writer had asked the previous owners to move out to fill the home with, I quote, young blood. Creepy. Delving deep into the past, it does seem like the house was once sold for a dollar in the 1950s, which is pretty curious. The couple the current owners bought the property off, the Wood family, wanted a quick sale. In the watcher's first note to the new family, they made reference to the couple's children. They said, once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them out. Then in later letters, the watcher asked who was occupying what bedroom. They claimed that they liked to be able to track the family as they moved through the house. It seems that the watcher was actually one in a long line of mysterious watchers. In their first letter they wrote, My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s and my father watched in the 1960s. It's now my time. I've been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. I mean what? The buyers freaked out, which I totally understand, and they even started a lawsuit to sue the Wood family who sold it to them. They accused them of hiding information about the voyeur. The most recent update of this story is actually the couple who received the letters and made the whole story public have finally sold the house, but at a loss. The police still have no idea who the watcher could be. Coming into number 5 we have Christopher Marlowe. I love a bit of Christopher Marlowe action, I really do. Dear Kit is supposedly a historical figure from Shakespearean times. He was thought to be a great friend of William Shakespeare, although some say Shakespeare stole his work and others say that Marlowe could have been the bard himself, masquerading under a different name. Christopher Marlowe was said to be outrageously attractive and a very hard partier. Hats off to him. He unfortunately was murdered aged 29, a sadness which is resounded across Shakespeare's work. In his short years, Christopher Marlowe made quite the impression. He disappeared from Cambridge University for nearly a year and he returned 32 weeks later to demand his Master of the Arts degree, which he was given. He was once arrested in the Netherlands for counterfeiting coins, but he was bailed out, and he may or may not have been involved in murdering an innkeeper's son. Despite being the son of a shoemaker, he became a favourite in Queen Elizabeth's court, which is why he got away with so much. Some say he was indeed a spy for the Queen. He was killed in a brawl, or so the story goes. Many people think that it was a planned attack. Christopher Marlowe was reportedly buried buried in an unmarked grave. Curious. Ah, uh, coming into number 4, we've got Casanova. Casanova bro, what's your secret? 
Well, that my friends is a mystery. You may have heard of the term Casanova, which generally means a man popular with the ladies. However, Casanova was indeed a real person. Born in 1725 and died in 1798, Casanova was an Italian adventurer who was the OG playboy of the western world, although there are rumours that he was a Venetian spy, which actually is a rumour he perpetuated himself. Casanova was reported to have seduced over 130 prominent women, a handful of men. He invented the lottery in France and helped Mozart write the libretto to Don Giovanni. How Casanova managed to woo so many people and be so famous, how he managed to invent so many successful get rich schemes, how he lived such a high drama life. I mean, the guy escaped from prison at one point. Honestly, it's a pure mystery. Casanova was morally dubious, although this was the 1700s. He wrote a book called Histoire de ma vie, Story of My Life, and it is well regarded as one of the best autobiographies of all time. His book, amongst others, has honestly inspired me to write my own. Casanova. What a lad. Coming in at number 3 we have Marika Rock. How Marika Rock made a comeback after being associated with Adolf Hitler? Well, that's certainly a mystery. Marika was born in Egypt but was of Hungarian nationality, however she made her name as a dancer, singer and film actress in Nazi Germany. It's rumoured that she was a lover of both Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler, although the latter is less likely. Nonetheless, she was a powerful woman in the Third Reich, and after the war she was banned from the stage for two years. She was labelled a disgrace. Somehow she managed to claw her way back into favour though and quickly became one of Europe's most famous actresses. In 1948 she received the prestigious German Bambi Media Award. All seemed to be forgiven. It was later revealed that actually she was a very successful spy for the Russians or Soviets as they had been. It's also suggested that she may have been involved in killing a few people. I honestly feel like there needs to be a movie about this woman. I can't speak Hungarian or German, but aside from that, I would love to play her. So, casting directors, I'm your gal. Yeah. Coming in at number two, we have the Pied Piper of Hamelin. No, it's not a fairy tale. It turns out that the Pied Piper of Hamelin was real, and yes, he did seem to spirit away a bunch of kids. The popular fairy tale says that the town of Hamelin was infested with rats when a colourful clothed man turned up and said that he would get rid of them for payment. Except he was never paid, so in a fit of rage, he stole the town's children and led them through a mountain. Only, well, did this actually happen? Surviving town records from the Church of Hamelin in Germany say, and I quote, In the year of 1284, on the day of St. John's and Paul on June 26th, by a piper clothed in many kinds of colours, 130 children born in Hamelin were seduced and lost at the place of execution near the Copen. It's actually thought that the children were taken as part of a children's crusade and that the whole business with the rats was added later as some kind of explanation. Some even say that the real piper was a paedophile who abducted children in their sleep. Suffice to say, he and the children were never found. What a mystery. The ultimate mystery at number one, we have Nostradamus. Michel de Nostradamus, short de Nostradamus for us, was a notable French astrologer, doctor, occultist and seer. I love a good seer. He was born in France in 1503 and he died relatively short life in 1566. The man was expelled from university for his work as an apothecary, which is pretty witchy and I like it. Nostradamus is best known for his book Le Prophecie, which he predicted future events, many of which have actually come true. Some of the prophecies people identify as being true are the death of King Henry II of France, the Great Fire of London, the French Revolution, the discovery of pasteurisation, the rise of Hitler, the success of Charles de Gaulle, the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the assassination of JFK and 9-11, just to name a few. Prophecies yet to come true are zombies rising from the grave, mega droughts in North America, a weakened west, catastrophic earthquakes and World War 3. Oh, and there's a chap called Mabus who signals the end of the world. Cool. 
thanks Nostradamus. Or is he getting his information? I need more information, but I won't get any, cause it's a good old fashioned mystery. Alright, coming in at number 10 we have the Prince of Silence. Meet William John Cavendish Scott Bentnick. He lived between 1800 and 1879. Sorry, you want his proper title? That's William John Cavendish Scott Bentnick, the Marquis of Titchfield and the 5th Duke of Portland. However, he liked to be known as the Prince of Silence, but we're just going to call him William. William was rumoured to be disfigured, although in reality he may have just hated being around people. The only person who was allowed to see him was his valet and chauffeur, and even then, he shielded his face. If his staff ever saw him, they were instructed to ignore him. He did not want to talk. They were also bound to silence over his appearance. Oddly, he built a giant roller skating ring for his staff. He was also said to have built 15 miles of underground tunnels that allowed him to move around undetected. I honestly feel like rich people get to be eccentric, whereas poor people just didn't have enough time in the day to be quirky, they just had to get stuff done and survive. Coming in at number 9, we have the man who couldn't stop eating. Oh. Honestly, my first thought was like, I feel you sir, but after reading about this French peasant boy known as Tarer, I actually think that really, I'm not that hungry. So it seems that Tarer was rejected by his parents after they found out that he was eating them out of house and home. Literally. Then he was going out of the house and eating all of the animal feed too. He was so smelled bad, like really, really, really bad. He travelled to Paris and drew a crowd by eating live animals and large stones, but when the revolution began, he became a soldier where he required quadruple rations and ate stray cats. Ugh. He became a spy as his general saw his unusual skill and he was tasked by delivering military messages and secrets by smuggling them in his mouth. He was caught, he betrayed his general, he was savagely beaten and he ended up in hospital. What did he do there? He started eating dead people and drinking blood. It is rumoured that he ate a baby, but he very strongly refutes it. It all got too much for him and eventually he died of a ruptured intestine aged 27. When the autopsy happened, the surgeons had to stop midway because he smelled so bad. If you thought that was gross, our next mysterious human story is very strange and very gross indeed. We're talking about Gloria Ramirez, aka the toxic woman at number 8. Gloria Ramirez's life isn't the mystery here, it's her death. Up until the age of 31, she seemed like a happy and healthy young woman. That was until the evening of February the 19th, 1994, when she was admitted to hospital in Riverside, California. She was experiencing a rapid heart rate, a drop in blood pressure, and could not form normal sentences. Doctors tried to save her, but she started admitting a garlic smell, and when her blood was taken, it had weird light brown particles in it and smelled like ammonia. At odds with these symptoms, it was discovered that she had cervical cancer, which is extremely bizarre. Nurses tried to work on her to save her, but one by one they started to faint. Others experienced inexplicable paralysis. When her autopsy was conducted, it had to be done by doctors in hazmat suits to protect themselves. What was going on? Honestly, we don't know. Coming into number 7, we have the people of Easter Island. What happened to the people of Easter Island? You know Easter Island, right? The big remote island in the middle of the Pacific, the one with all the big stone heads. See? This island used to be the home to an ancient civilization that died under very mysterious circumstances. On the island, artifacts, wooden tablets, and the like were discovered with strange, undeciphered writing on it. Now, the language has been given the, in my opinion, awesome name of Ronga Rongo. The writing is a series of glyphs, which is like a symbol kind of writing. There have been many attempts to crack the code, but so far they have been unsuccessful. It's thought that the language is a special and rare case of an independent invention of human writing, which is really cool. If the Rongo Rongo language is ever translated, it could reveal the scary secret of how the people of Easter Island died, but for now, it's a mystery. Coming into number 6, we have this spaceman. Look at this photo, do you recognise it? It is one of the most famous photos of the 20th century. This photo was taken on a family outing to a beautiful part of the northern English countryside. The photographer was Carlisle fireman Jim Templeton, who took a picture of his daughter. Water. Only when he got it developed, there was an unlikely photobomber, a NASA spacesuit wearing cosmonaut. What a cosmonaut was doing in Stolway in the British countryside, we don't know. The Templetons were baffled, and soon the media picked up on the mystery figure. The family claimed that there was absolutely nobody else around when the picture was taken. 
Also, it actually really does look like a spacesuit, doesn't it? Film company Kodak offered a reward to anyone who could prove that the photo was faked, but absolutely nobody could. So, who's the mystery spaceman? Again, we don't know. Ooh, I like this one at number five. We have Banksy. I am always here for a bit of Banksy. Absolutely always. Banksy is a guerrilla artist who creates his work as graffiti in urban spaces. Banksy is known for his political messages. For example, he has depicted rioters throwing flowers rather than grenades, a naked man on the wall of a sexual health clinic, and you know, he's got his famous paintings or graffiti paintings, the balloon girl and the bomb hugger. It's powerful stuff. It's presumed that Banksy is from Bristol. In England, as that is where the art started. But his artworks have appeared across the world. There's even one in Toronto, actually. Despite living in the age of CCTV, Banksy's identity has never been discovered. Also, we're so busy saying he and his regarding Banksy, but I guess he could very well be a woman. I kind of hope so. Have you guys noticed that when we create lists like this, there are more men than women? I think that's because while women's stories are told, and they definitely did have adventures and stories, history is saturated with stories from the perspective of the patriarch. Prove me wrong. Speaking of unidentified people in famous photographs, we have the man of Tiananmen Square at number four. This is one of the most important images of all time. This image is of an unidentified Chinese man who stood in front of a number of big ass tanks as the Chinese government rolled out of Tiananmen Square, having suppressed protesters by force. The man holding shopping bags stood in front of the tanks, stopping them in their path in a simple and powerful act of resistance. The moment was captured by photographer Jim Widener and became a symbol of protest across the world. We don't know who the man who stopped the tanks was or what happened to him after this image was taken. It's likely that he was killed, in which case he will never have known what an impact his actions had. Coming into number three, we have the Salem Witches. Here be witches. The Salem Witch Trials were one of the weirdest moments in history. A cult hysteria swept over the town of Salem in Massachusetts as 19 people were convicted of witchcraft and killed in 1692, with hundreds of others accused or afflicted with hysteria. So, what was going on? Why were 14 women and 5 men considered to be witches? Why was colonial North America in general obsessed with witches back then? The short answer is probably religious fear and possibly poisoned bread. But the long answer involves many shades of we just don't know. Okay, this is one for my fellow Harry Potter lovers. You know that I'm the Slytherin queen. We have Nicholas Flamel at number two. Hello there, Nick. Mate, Nicholas Flamel was real. Not totally in the way that JK Rowling claimed, no, but his character in The Philosopher's Stone was based on a real man. This real man just so happened to be considered to be immortal. Flamel was a French alchemist, which is basically like a potion master. He was the OG Snape. He wrote mysterious books filled with very strange symbols that people believed discussed a magic life prolonging stone. Sound familiar? It seems that even though Flamel died in 14. 1917, books that sounded very much as if they were written by him cropped up hundreds of years into the future. Finally, coming into number one, we have Helen of Troy. This woman gets a bad rep, and that is arguably because her story is told by an assortment of jilted men and not from her own perspective. Helen of Troy was said to be the most beautiful woman in the world, and oddly, she's painted both as a hero on the one hand and as a whore on the other, which I mean. Helen of Troy was heir to the Greek kingdom of Sparta, and it was said that she was the spark that lit the Trojan War. So who was she? How did she make her way into so many history books and works of literature? What made her so beautiful? And did she really spark one of the most epic wars of all time? Some even claim that she was the daughter of the god Zeus, yet she seemed to be a real person. This is all very confusing, but as she died thousands upon thousands of years ago, we're likely to never be able to detangle fact from fiction and know more about who she really was.